Seventy years ago, last week, a ship called Empire Windrush arrived from the Caribbean to London. Many of you may have heard of this recently. Last week, the Prime Minister of Britain, Theresa May, had a ceremony in Downing Street uh, commemorating their contribution to British life. And yesterday, the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, had a one-day ceremony doing the same. I'm going to tell a story today not about Windrush, but about Albert, a young boy who came on a boat from Barbados about 10 to 15 years after Windrush. Albert arrived in the early 60s on his mother's British passport. At the time, it was common for children to come on their parents' uh, documents. He then started school, uh, built a life here, and ended up being a painter and decorator, and then working as a teaching assistant in a school. So he contributed hugely economically, culturally, socially to Britain, to his neighborhood, to his family. And when he retired, he unfortunately hadn't built up enough money to own his own house, so he had to continue to rent. And when he tried to get a property, he found that landlords rejected his documentation. They didn't believe that they should be renting to him. He then ended up homeless, and he ended up being detained in a detention center by the UK authorities, threatened with deportation to Barbados, an island he hadn't visited since he was a young child over 50 years before. This injustice is now known as an injustice that faced the Windrush generation. How did this happen? How did Albert end up in the situation? Well, the immediate reason were recent changes to immigration law by the UK authorities. Changes that require landlords to check documents thoroughly, and that many, mean that many landlords, in order to avoid fines, only accept a narrow range of documents, such as passports. Like nine million other people in Britain, Albert did not have a passport. He didn't have a passport in part because he didn't earn enough money ever to travel, and had no need uh, for a passport. But there are deeper reasons why Albert was in the predicament that he was in, and indeed thousands of others like him. Why was Albert asked for a passport, but not all of the other nine million who don't have a passport? To understand this, we have to think deeper, not just about Albert or about Windrush, but about who we are as a country who Britain is. And I think the snappy way to put it is Windrush is us. But in fact, that understates the issue because Albert's predicament was also der derives from the British Empire, and more specifically, the unwinding of the British Empire and how the British state responded uh, in terms of in immigration and nationality law. So we talk a bit about the British Empire, and I'm not going to belabor uh, all of the injustices and wrongs, but what I am going to foreground is the fact that in the British Empire, there was an inequality of rights to citizenship. It was woven into Britishness that there were different rights, different policies. So for example, by the time India became independent, life expectancy in British India was 30 years old, and life expectancy in British Britain, to coin a phrase, was nearly 70 years old. So when the empire was being unwound, Britain needed to repatriate these racial inequalities of rights and of citizenship. These were not minor issues. This was a defining feature of the British state that was the British empire for 500 years. So how did they do this? What was the concept, what was the legal term to repatriate those racial inequalities of rights here to this island? The term that was used and that remains in use is patriality. Now, patriality basically means that if you have a grandparent born on this island, then you can claim British citizenship. But if, like me, or like Albert, 
All four of your grandparents were born British, all eight of your great-grandparents, all 16 of your great-great-grandparents, and so on and so forth and so on. You are not able to claim British citizenship in virtue of your patriality. So patriality is inherently a racially discriminatory concept and was required with the unwinding of empire. But it goes further because it affects not just Albert. His children are therefore unable to claim British citizenship despite being British born. His grandchildren, similarly, are not immediately granted British citizenship. In fact, there are cases of 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds, 14-year-olds born in Britain being required to pass a good character test by the Home Office. A 13-year-old was recently denied British citizenship because he had a fight in school and our government authorities decided that he was a bad character. These inequalities of access to citizenship are not random. Black and minority ethnic people do not have the same ability to access rights, citizenship, and nationality. And the origin of these inequalities is the British Empire. We have a bit of a selective amnesia, of course, about British Empire. We honor people who do good deeds in Britain with something called the Order of the British Empire. We give people membership of the Order of the British Empire, and that's a good thing. We think we are honoring people. Um, and yet we can't get our heads around the fact that Albert and those like him have been so dishonored precisely because they were living members of a real British Empire. Albert, I said earlier that he came on a British passport. It ne needs to be clarified, which is that he came on a passport that named him as a citizen of the UK and colonies. So the passport that he arrived on was differentiated even at that point. So I tell this story not simply so that we understand the injustice of Albert and of what we now call the Windrush generation, uh, but also to explain the ongoing long-term effects for his children, his grandchildren, and the difficulties for any immigration policy to be implemented without being racially discriminatory. I think for us to provide justice to Albert and the many like him, to ensure that his children and grandchildren get justice, we need to dig deeper into our own history, to recognize this isn't some minor chapter or appendix to who British is, British Britain is, to what Britishness means, but is a defining feature. We're used to thinking, I think, of racial discrimination being a defining feature of the American state. And I think one of the reasons we understand that better is because the African and white Americans lived in the same geographic location. We forget, or selectively forget, that because the Asian and African people lived over there, that somehow that wasn't us doing the racial discrimination. It was us. It remains us. Further, if we are to understand why we don't respond to racial inequalities, why we don't understand them today, I think it's because we don't take that lesson to heart enough. It's also the 50th anniversary this year of the organization I work for, which was founded to try to eliminate racial discrimination. 50 years on, we probably haven't been as successful as we'd like, but I think one of the reasons is that people hear about racial inequalities, but they don't connect that to any form of injustice, to any form of wrongdoing, to anything that's about us as a nation. So understanding this history is not just about Albert in another way, which is that if we want to tackle, for example, the fact that if you are, have an Asian or African sounding surname, and this is research commissioned by the UK government, you have to send in twice as many CVs just to get an interview with the exact same CV or resume, same qualifications. Why is it that people with Asian and African sounding surnames might have to send in twice as many CVs? It shouldn't be a mystery to us, but somehow it still remains surprising and shocking when I t uh, tell employers or the government uh, of the, the British government that statistic. So to deliver justice for Albert and his generation, to deliver justice for his children, grandchildren, 
and indeed for his great-grandchildren, but just as importantly, to understand who we are as a, as a wider country, we need to unearth and excavate this history of racial inequality that marked the British Empire, of which the existing British state is, of course, the successor. To tackle racial inequalities in the present, we have to understand their origin in the past. Thank you.